welcome everyone on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia and our sponsor for today's event, Biomodels LLC. I'd like to welcome you to clinically relevant animal models of inflammatory bowel disease, utilizing classical and novel approaches to evaluate potential therapies. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'll be the host for today's event. I would like to introduce our presenters for today. They are Dr. Gregory D. Ling, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of Biomodels, and Dr. Dominic R. Beal, who is a scientist from Biomodels. Welcome, gentlemen. The presenter ball is yours. Thanks, Elizabeth. So to start, I just wanted to give a quick overview of Biomodels and, uh, and who we are. We are a preclinical contract research organization that's located in Watertown, Massachusetts, so just outside of Boston and Cambridge here. We were actually founded in 1997 out of the lab of our chief scientific officer, Dr. Steve Sonis at Brigham Women's Hospital. And our focus since then has been on highly translational models of human diseases in a variety of conditions for a variety of clients ranging from small startups to large pharma. Again, our, our, our main goal here is to simply transition drugs and biologics from um, various stages of concept and into patients. Uh, and with that, you know, kind of one of our biggest success stories has been that we have facilitated 41, I believe, compounds to date um, from a kind of a concept state into patients for multiple disease indications. Uh, our therapeutic expertise here lies within inflammation and autoimmunity, oncology, pulmonary disease, fibrosis, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, neurological disorders, as well as cancer supportive care. So the objectives for today's webinar are pretty simple. What we want to do is start by doing a quick review of the current state of IBD, giving a little overview of the disease, um, some of the differences between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, as well as the current treatment strategies that are being used uh, for each of these disease states. We'll also do a quick, quick outline of some of the new therapies that are under development currently. The vast majority of the webinar today will be focusing around the review of several different animal models of IBD. Um, and our hope is that we'll be able to teach people how to uh, select the appropriate model based on their desired therapeutic strategy and disease indication. We're also going to go through quite a bit of data today that shows the disease response to different positive control therapies, which we feel is also very important in these models. On top of that, and kind of intertwined with that, we're going to discuss a few techniques that we use to enhance the in-life as well as endpoint data analysis of these IBD models. One of the biggest things that you'll see today are um, a lot of images from uh, rodent video endoscopy analysis that we perform, as well as fax analysis of cell suspensions for some of the more immunologically relevant models, such as the adoptive transfer and GBH. So just a little background in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, IBD itself is composed of a spectrum of chronic gastrointestinal disorders. One of the hallmarks of these conditions are that they alternate between periods of relapse and remission. And during periods of relapse, clinically, they're characterized by diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, and, and bleeding. The diagnosis for any of these conditions is, is usually done by endoscopy. Causal, causally, we really don't know what the etiology of um, IBD is. Um, there's a number of factors that are considered to be involved in disease progression and disease onset, there's environmental, genetics. Uh, but if you look here in this figure at the bottom of the page, you know, things such as stress, the gut microbiota, uh, which is garnering a lot of attention as of late, um, diet, general immune system dysfunction, um, genetic factors, smoking, sleep, or the lack thereof general reactive oxygen species and, and oxidative stress. So it's likely that, you know, more than one of these factors are involved in the ultimate uh, response of, of, of IBD. Um, a little background on the epidemiology of IBD. So currently there are more than 1.2 million cases um, that are estimated to occur within the U.S. Um, and that is actually divided equally between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. There are approximately 10,000 new cases that are diagnosed annually. And disease onset can really occur at, at any age, although the peak of incidence is usually during late adolescence or early adulthood. Um, and interestingly, there's a similar prevalence between um, these, these diseases in both male and female. So a little bit more specific into ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, kind of the two, um, the two biggest, uh, I would say, disease areas in IBD. Ulcerative colitis affects only the colon, um, and the inflammation and ulcerations that occur here are typically restricted to the mucosa and submucosa. 
And based on the you know, kind of the immunological profile, TH2 cytokines predominate in the exacerbation of this disease. Although we do know from clinical treatment strategies that anti-TNF therapies do work in this disease. So um, obviously there's a little bit of overlap between TH2 and, and TH1. I mean, if you look below here, you'll see some endoscopy images from, uh, you know, kind of a mild ulcerative colitis to a more severe ulcerative colitis. But you see pretty um, uniform involvement of disease throughout the colon. Crohn's disease, on the other hand, can affect any part of the intestine, uh, but most commonly affects the terminal ileum. Areas of inflammation are, can be dispersed between uh, healthy areas. Um, so if you can see on this image here, we see areas of ulceration adjacent to areas that look um, you know, very normal. In fact, you can see the, the very clear vascularization here that looks almost like healthy tissue. While on the other side, you see a much more severe disease involvement. So outside of the colon, though, these can, uh, in Crohn's disease, this ulceration and inflammation can actually occur in other regions, such as the esophagus um, and stomach. As we mentioned earlier, well, Th1 cytokines um, predominate this um, indication, and again, TNF-alpha therapies are used very commonly. So the current and kind of the traditional treatment approach to IBD is, is kind of hierarchical based on disease severity. So as patients present with mild disease, they usually are treated with relatively mild therapeutics. Antibiotics can be used in some cases for Crohn's. 5-ASA, uh, either orally or as an enema, can be used for the treatment for, for ulcerative colitis. As disease severity increases, the treatment strategies become a little more um, aggressive using steroids, uh, mercaptopurines, methotrexate, um, or prednisolone. Or prednisone. Um, and then as basically as, as these fail to induce remission um, or fail to maintain remission, other strategies are, are now being used, such as anti-TNF therapies, uh, natalizumab, another biologic. And if all else fails, uh, surgery can be done to resect the portion of bowel that is involved. Uh, obviously, that is a, a late step in the process, and it can be avoided with, uh, with therapeutic intervention. Um, it's, it's always preferred. So as IV, IVD treatment strategies are, are developing and evolving, so are some of the new therapies that are coming out to um, potentially alleviate some of the concerns. So clinically, the goal of, of, of therapy is to, to induce deep uh, clinical and endoscopic remission of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. So the clinical symptomology doesn't always necessarily correlate 100% with the endoscopic symptomology. So certain patients can have uh, no clinical signs of disease, meaning, you know, very little abdominal cramping, diarrhea, or bloody stool, but still have ulcerative disease within their colon. So it's important to have both um, the, the endoscopic evaluation show no disease as well as clinically the patients being healthy. As these treatment strategies are, you know, optimal treatment strategies are still being defined, and there's been a lot of, um, I think, back and forth over the years in terms of um, the best approach. Obviously, there's a push towards individualized therapy. Um, as there are with a number of disease indications, as you know, some people respond very well to the steroids, other people don't, and, and the same is true with anti-TNFs. Um, so some of the thoughts are using an earlier aggressive therapeutic strategy um, that may limit down course uh, relapse of disease. Uh, but with that, there are some long-term safety questions um, and efficacy outcome questions that, that need to be answered, um, especially as some of the biologics have been known to cause you know, malignancies down the line after chronic use. Some of the novel approaches that are currently in development are antibodies for anti-IL-1223, which we'll actually talk a fair amount about in our presentation today, uh, selective adhesion molecule inhibitors, JAK inhibitors, um, fecal transplant, and micro microbiome modulating therapy. Um, again, these later two here are beginning to take a, get a, garner a lot of attention in the research field um, as we have known that you can modulate disease severity or induce disease based on the microbiome of the gut. So as we transition from the clinical side of IBD into the uh, preclinical and animal model side, I think it's important to kind of understand what we envision as the perfect animal model for evaluation of any therapy. Um, it's important that the animal model replicate the clinical condition, that the endpoints are translatable to those used in clinical trials and can be easily interpreted. The underlying biology should be the same or as similar as possible to that in humans. Um, and it's also important that these diseases in animals respond to targeted treatment paradigms that work well in patients. 
the model also should, needs to be cost effective and provide actionable information in order to make determination on the next steps. One of the things that we've done at BioModels to really enhance the, the overall uh, reproducibility and, and reliability of the IBD models is the use of video endoscopy. Since it's critical that in, in IBD models that you can demonstrate mucosal healing, as that's a, that's a strong push from the FDA, this is a very nice way of, of monitoring that. Um, in the past, IBD models mandated that the animals were sacrificed um, at defined time points, histological measures were done to uh, assess uh, tissue damage, which precluded the continual traction, tracking of disease longitudinally over time. However, with video endoscopy now, we can do multiple assessments of disease um, in a single animal over you know, anywhere from acute study to chronic studies that are out several weeks. The images that we obtain from colons and, and rodents are nearly identical to those in patients. I mean, we can see some examples here on the left. Obviously, the size is slightly different, but what we're looking at here are the, the, the vascular patterns and the disease patterns, um, you know, ulceration, bleeding. Um, it all presents very similar um, in the rodent and in the patient. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, what's nice with this is if you have the disease colon, you can show post-therapy post you know, mucosal healing and uh, treatment improvement. So to go into a little bit more detail about the video endoscopy itself, um, the endoscopy is performed under isoflurane anesthesia. So it's a you know, very light anesthesia and very quickly performed. Uh, we can collect both videos and photos. And it is typically scored on a four-point scale. So we'll go through some images here. So this, this is normally scaled on the scored on a zero to four scale. Zero being a normal healthy colon, and we see an image of that here below. Uh, what we're looking for in a healthy colon is very clear vasculature, um, no edema, no swelling, no inflammation, no bleeding. As the disease progresses, we begin to see scores of one, where you can start to see edema. The vascular pattern becomes much less clear, um, and there's likely some underlying uh, inflammation that is involved here as well. As the disease begins to develop even further, we'll maintain those uh, edema, inflammation, and, and loss of vascular pattern, but we'll also start to see some friability of the tissue. So, uh, local areas of bleeding, uh, primarily in response to insertion of the endoscopic probe. Uh, as disease progresses even further, we see images such as this upon entrance of the colon, and you'll see very areas of active bleeding, um, very robust inflammation, very robust edema, and essentially no uh, areas where you can um, see the underlying vasculature. And even one step beyond this is the most severe that we typically allow these models to become, um, and that's areas where there's frank ulceration and, and active bleeding. And this is, you know, obviously a, a very severe condition um, and, and a large ulcer in this animal. So just to provide a little overview of the rodent models of IBD that we currently offer and that we're going to discuss today, um, this table here will, will kind of walk us through the, the different approaches that we use, um, as well as the different study lengths and the species that we can use these models in. So to start, we're going to be talking about DSS and colitis in a few different manners, both an acute and a chronic model that basically ranges from 10 to 21 days, a more an even further chronic model that uses repeated cycling of DSS that can go out to 35 or even longer days, um, the acute TNBS model, which is a, a five-day study, um, the acute exalazone-induced colitis model, which is typically a five-day study. And then we get into some of the more immune-driven models, such as the CD40 monoclonal antibody-induced models. This is a CD40 agonist um, approach. Uh, here, colitis severity peaks on day three and persists through day seven. Um, and then we get into the uh, models of adoptive transfer. So um, Dominic will be speaking about this a little bit later, but we are going to be talking about two different models of adoptive transfer, the CD45 RB high model, as well as the CD62 ligand model. And then finally, um, a newer model that we've been working with a fair amount here at BioModels is a model of graft-versus-host disease. And then one of the clinical conditions that appears with that is a GVH-associated colitis, um, which is thought to be very important in the disease pathobiology. So to start, we'll go through some of the details of the acute mouse model of DSS-induced colitis. Um, this is probably one of the most classic models that is published today. Um, you know, most of the therapies that have been uh, developed over the years have gone through this model at one point or another. What we're looking at here is a 21-day model um, where DSS is administered from day zero to five, um, and we're performing endoscopy at, at three to four different time points over the course of the disease. 
Uh, we'll focus on the day 7, 14, and 21 time points, but that's, you know, that's, we can basically um, set up a protocol such that the endoscopy can be done at any, at any point in time. Um, this first set of slides here looks at the treatment with prednisolone um, as a positive control, and we see you know, pretty good effects with prednisolone um, in terms of uh, disease, improvement in disease severity. However, the effects of prednisolone aren't quite as reliable um, from study to study as we would like to see, so in some subsequent slides, we'll look at some biological therapy. But basically, to get a gist of the overall progression of disease in the DSS model, we'll look at the weight curve on the right. Um, the animals are exposed to DSS from day zero to five, and then start to lose weight um, approximately around day seven, and the weight loss usually peaks around day 10, persists for a few days. Um, after that, the animals will actually start to recover body weight, and, and by the end of the study, are essentially back to baseline. Um, we can see here that prednisolone actually has had a little bit of an additive effect on weight loss and can be somewhat catabolic um, at the doses that are used. Uh, what's interesting, though, is when we look at the weight loss recovery here, um, these animals are essentially back to normal. But when we look at endoscopy, the animals are far from normal. They still have very um, robust colitis that is occurring, even though clinically the animals look healthy. And I think that gets back to you know, this, this comment that we made earlier about the, the human condition and having both clinical and endoscopic remission um, as an endpoint. Um, if we look below here, these images may be a little small depending on your screen, but what we can see is the progression um, of disease from day 0, 7, 14, and 21 um, in this acute DSS model, essentially going from a um, naive colon um, to a slightly inflamed edematous colon to uh, a colon with inflammation, edema, and um, some bleeding here, and probably active ulceration. So we get into the peak disease around day 12 to 14, and a slightly, res slightly resolved image by day 21. Um, and then we have all the histological correlates that go along with it, showing the loss of all the crypt structure, uh, edema, and inflammation, and even some areas of ulceration. As I mentioned, basically to, to bot, um, with the development of many biological therapies in IVD, uh, we have also gone through and evaluated a couple of the most common um, therapies used um, and have shown pretty good results with these. So this is a typical study design for a, a mouse DSS study. Group one is an untreated control group, usually no DSS, and there goes the same video endoscopy and sacrifice schedule. Group two is a vehicle control, so DSS only. You know, we're giving them the same vehicle as we're, we're giving the uh, animals that are being treated. Group three is an anti-P40 treatment, so the anti-P40 is an anti-IL-1223 treatment strategy, and that's being given three days a week, or three, yeah, three times a week from day six to 21. Uh, the same is being given with an anti-TNF monoclonal antibody, um, same dosing schedule. So these are two therapeutic dosing schedules where we're allowing the disease to develop slightly before we're initiating treatment. And as soon as we initiate treatment, we're going to do an endoscopy the day after, again again on day 12 and again on day 21. Some of the benefits of using this as a model is it's relatively short study duration, so you can very efficiently screen compounds. Um, it's used for full useful for the evaluation of both prophylactic and therapeutic dosing strategies. So here we're dosing therapeutically, but um, you could also dose prophylactically starting on day zero or day minus one. Um, and we do see very consistent disease penetrance in these DSS um, colitis studies. So here if we're looking at the disease response again in response and the additional response to the positive controls, um, the weight loss that we see here is very typical for the model. Again, is starting to occur around day seven after the removal of DSS. Um, and peaks, you know, between day 10 and 12. Interestingly enough, with treatment starting on day 6, uh, the anti-TNF therapy really has no effect on, on body weight curve. However, when we look at the results of the anti-P40 treatment, essentially one day later, the anti-P40 treatment blunts weight loss, um, and the animals then recover. So this is obviously a very significant effect on body weight uh, and a very robust and quick effect in terms of the uh, target. When we look at the endoscopy scores here to the right, what's, what the, this also is very interesting. We see very consistent scores on day seven. So this is just a day after treatment. But as we get to day 12, which is allowed as six days of treatment, we start to see some good separation between anti-TNF, P40, and the vehicle control. What we're seeing here as time progresses even longer is, is, is additional separation um, of disease severity. So. Basically, we're looking at a, you know, a, a score of 2.5 to a score of 1.5 with the P40 and a score of 2.5 to a score of 2 with the anti-TNF. So both of 
these changes are, are clinically meaningful and, um, and likely are statistically significant. But I think one of the more important things to take home from this is if you look at the weight change as being a, a kind of a, a clinical endpoint in this model, um, essentially you, you would assume that the CD, the FIP40 rather, um, is working very well, which it is. Um, what, it, what we'd also assume is that the anti-TNF is basically having no effect, um, which is not necessarily the case. There's definitely a uh, an improvement with that treatment, but it's just not reflected in the weight curves. Um, so in short, you know, what we see is a robust induction of disease with DSS treatment. We're able to significantly improve body weight with both or with the anti-P40 antibody, but not anti-TNF. Um, a significant improvement in endoscopy and histology with both therapies in the absence of that weight change. Um, and the fact that these weight loss and colitis severity scores do not always correlate, um, meaning we need to be careful about picking the correct endpoints in these models. Moving on from the acute stage of DSS and colitis, we're going to talk a little bit more about the chronic uh, model. This is done by doing three cycles of DSS over the course of about four weeks. Um, so instead of doing a, a single five-day cycle, these animals are on um, four-day cycles for three different time points at a lower, slightly lower concentration of DSS. Here we looked at the treatment effects of all small molecule type agents, so no biologics were used here. Um, but we used a vehicle, we used prednisolone, we used cyclosporin A, and we also used 6 bal one All of these animals were dosed therapeutically starting on day 10, um, so well after the uh, end of the first cycle of DSS, and we monitored the colitis severity via endoscopy on days 10, 20, 27, and 34. Uh, with the study ending on day 34. Some of the advantages of using this chronic DSS model is it allows for longer study durations um, for increased dosing durations. So, um, you know, essentially we can dose all the way through here and, and get at least a month of, of dosing. Um, depending on the therapy, that can be, uh, you know, very useful. Um, it's good, as I mentioned, good for evaluating therapeutic dosing. Um, and this model has, uh, given that we're doing three cycles of DSS, has even more consistent disease penetrance than the acute DSS model. Um, so essentially, there's very uniform um, disease throughout the colon, um, and it's, uh, it, it seems to be, you know, a, a very nice model in that respect. So getting into some of the data from this model. So on the left-hand side here, we're looking at weight change. Um, so we can look at this by cycle of DSS. So to start, the animals are on a cycle from day zero to four. You'll see a very mild weight loss that occurs after the removal of DSS. Um, the second cycle is from day 12 to 16, and this is really where we see the disease induction start to pick up. It's after that second, second round of DSX exposure where the animals lose approximately 15% of their body weight. And then the third round, basically, you'll see a small change, um, but it's more or less keeping the disease at a, at a consistent and persistent level. Um, as we look at the endoscopy scores over the course of time, you can see that even after that first exposure to DSS, the animals do develop um, the mild to moderate colitis. Um, as we get through the second and third uh, treatment round of DSS, the colitis severity increases to, to more of a moderate level, where is what we target, you know, in approximately a score of two and a half to three with the vehicle. Um, as we look at the treatment paradigms over this course of time, you see that there are, you know, subtle effects with prednisolone, cyclosporine, and 6 one And these effects really seem to kind of coalesce as we get towards day 27, um, which we think is probably due to the timing, uh, timing removed from the DSS exposure. And then as we get out into the more of a, a recovery phase, uh, we start to see even more separation with the positive control therapies just prior to sacrifice on day 34. Um, so again, here going from a score of about 2.8 down to a score of about 2.2. Um, and that is, a, in these models, is a clinically meaningful um, signal. And again, you know, with this, that we're seeing, you know, very similar effects with weight loss being exacerbated or no change, um, but still seeing therapeutic effects uh, of the compounds. So, um, you know, again, harping on the point that it's, it's necessary to um, include and choose the best endpoints possible for, for each study that is performed. Some additional data from this model, we can kind of just walk through these endoscopy images to show what the disease looks like in the chronic DSS situation. Um, on the left-hand side here at the top, the no-DSS vehicle, so we see very clear vasculature. Um, as the disease is developed here, there's a score of approximately three. You see the gross um, bleeding. We see basically no uh, normal mucosa, so lots of edema and inflammation. And then you can see general improvement with all of the therapies. 
um, that are involved. So just mild areas of bleeding um, and, and, and even some clear vasculature in spots. And then if we look at the histological um, comparison of these slides, you see something very similar. Um, you'll see you know, active ulceration, active inflammation, edema in the controls, and still many of the same components, just to a lesser extent in the treatment groups. So again, these models are very difficult to get full, um, full remission of disease. Um, what we're looking for and what we look at as being successful is somewhere between a you know, 20 to 30 percent change in, in disease severity is a, is a very positive response. Um, it's a, it's a, a relatively robust disease model, and, and seeing changes much larger than that are, are um, you know, typically very unlikely. One of the other models that we've been working with uh, a fair amount, and we do this model in both mice and rats, is the TMBS-induced colitis model. Um, this model differs in its induction and its duration um, quite dramatically from DSS. So instead of giving DSS in the drinking water, here we're giving the TMBS um, as an acute dose intrarectally on day zero. Um, the TMBS itself is an ethanol to help with increasing permeability. Um, and after that, we see basically a very robust disease response that occurs within three days. Um, here we're just looking at a simple dose response of TNBS. Basically, we do this to ensure that we're getting the correct disease induction profile that we want for you know, evaluating therapies. Um, we're looking at a change here from three to four to five milligrams of TNBS. Um, so it does have a nice dose response in terms of its response in colitis severity. And the same is true with weight loss, with the five milligrams being the um, most persistent and severe weight loss that occurs. Uh, the TMBS model is, um, given that it's a very short model, it, it's much harder to use for therapeutic dosing. So in most cases, um, we use this model for prophylactic dosing starting on day zero or even on day minus one prior to TMBS administration. Uh, when we look at the images from TNBS, they're, they're definitely much more, much more graphic in terms of the amount of bleeding that we see and in terms of the epithelial erosion. Um, what's also interesting is that below the epithelium, you're not getting the same levels of disease involvement that you would see in DSS. There, are inflammation, uh, there is inflammation occurring in crypt loss. However, that you're not seeing the frank ulceration and the deep inflammation and edema that you would see in a DSS model. So while it looks to be very... Um, clinically severe, if you're looking at pro-inflammatory markers, uh, this model has a, you know, model, if we're looking at things like TNF and F6, it's about a log less than what we would expect to see in uh, DSS-induced colitis model. Now we're going to kind of start to transition into some of the more immunologically targeted models that we run in IBD. The first is a model of a CD40 agonist-induced um, colitis, and this model is run in RAG2 um, null mice, uh, so immunocompromised, immunodeficient mice. And what this allows us to do is run a model that's independent of T cells. And this model is very uh, useful for evaluating therapies that modulate the, immune, the DNA immune system. Um, it's also a very short model, so again, it provides a good screening tool um, for, for compounds. In the study we're going to talk about here, uh, we're looking at our same biological controls, an anti-P40 monoclonal antibody and an anti-TNF monoclonal antibody both dosed on day minus one, so prior to the anti-CD40 agonist. Um, so we're using prophylactic treatment strategy here to look at the downstream effects. The so video endoscopy is performed three and seven days later, and then the animals are euthanized on day seven. So what we see in this model is, is the induction of, I would say, mild to moderate colitis. It's not anywhere near as severe as what we see in DSS or in TMVS. However, that doesn't mean you can't get you know, very clear information from it. Um, so when we look down here at the images, I think this is just as helpful as looking at the, uh, the graphs, we see the naive control, again, being very clear vasculature, um, you know, essentially a healthy colon. And if we look here at the, the CD40 agonist vehicle group, we see the very pale colon. We see very few signs of vasculature. Um, you can see that it, it's somewhat edematous and thickened. Um, and then as we look at the therapeutic response, we see that the anti-TNF, you know, while it still has some areas that, that aren't 100% perfect, we do see a lot of areas of clear vasculature and, and, and relatively healthy-looking tissue. P40 antibody uh, does something similar, probably to a slightly lesser extent than the anti-TNF in this model. Uh, and if we look at the body weight change here, we also see, um, you know, a good induction of weight loss in the control, approximately 10%. 
Um, and with the prophylactic dosing that we used here, essentially very little weight loss with either the uh, anti-P40 or the anti-TNF antibody. Um, and then we do start to see some drop off as we get later here, but that could simply be due to um, the fact that we were only administering a single dose of, of antibody and we're now seven days post that dose. So all in all, a, um, you know, a, a relatively quick model, um, a very focused model, and um, you know, again, follows the path that we would expect in terms of the treatment response to uh, positive control therapy. So with that, I'm going to transition the talk to Dominic, who is going to um, review our IBD models of adoptive transfer-induced colitis, as well as our GBH. All right. Thanks, Greg. Okay. So, as Greg said, I'm going to go over the adoptive transfer colitis models and uh, GBHD. So, first of all, um, the colitis model. This is a, a, an induced chronic model. The mice develop disease at about three to five weeks post-cell transfer, and it does replicate many aspects of human disease. Uh, importantly, including the small bowel involvement, so the disease isn't restricted just to the colon. It can be treated with clinically relevant therapies such as anti-TNF. And one of the advantages slash disadvantages of this model is that it does focus directly on uh, T helper cells. You don't get the involvement of the of, uh, of a lot of innate immune response cells that you can target, but it does allow you to focus directly on on those cells if you want to look at um, regulatory roles, for example. So. Here is the, the model. We uh, biomodels use C57 black 6 donor mice. We harvest the splenocytes, isolate the naive T cells, and um, I'll talk about that in a bit. And those are injected into RAG2 deficient mice, which lack T and B cells. And then uh, in about three to five weeks, you see uh, the onset of weight loss and uh, colitis. Okay, so just a, an overview of the model. Uh, the naive T cells can be isolated using a variety of markers. CD45RB is the most commonly used one and uh, the one that's most, uh, most seen in the literature. But other markers uh, also include CD62 ligand and CD44, which uh, I will talk about later. The model itself is dependent on the purity of the transferred cells. So if you include memory T cells in with your naive T cells, they prevent uh, disease, for, uh, disease um, induction and progression. The classic approach in this model is to measure the disease induction severity by weight loss. So that gives you an in-life readout for disease, and it's used to confirm T cell engraftment. And then at the end of the study, the mice are sacrificed, and you look at uh, colon histology to verify that the disease is present. And I think that those two alone are not ideal, and I'll talk about um, the other ways that we've uh, added in readouts to uh, enhance this model. So the CD45RB high sort uh, over here, this is the splenocytes. This is just a forward side scatter fax plot. The first thing you do is a CD4 enrichment using a magnetic column, and uh, you get this population, which is highlighted in red here. And if you just look at that population, you can see it's about 90% CD4 positive. You take those CD4 positive cells and run them through a cell sorter and uh, get only the CD45 RB high expressing cells, which is this blue population and you inject those into the RAG2 uh, recipient mice. And you can see here that the cells that you get out of the cell sorter are about 96 to 97% CD45RB high, which is, which is very pure. This is the CD62 ligand CD44 sort. This is just a single step, just using a magnetic column. This is pre-sort and this is post-sort, and these plots just show CD62 ligand expression on the y-axis, CD44 expression on the x-axis. And looking at that, you've got about 90 plus percent um, naive T cells up here, CD62 ligand positive, CD44 negative. And then these two bottom uh, panels here just show exactly the same population of cells, but looking at CD45RB just for comparison with the other sorting method. And you can see that at the end of the sort, you do get a population that's about 97 plus percent CD45RB high. So essentially, whichever sort method you use, you're going to end up with the, the same population of cells. So just to compare the models, the CD45 RB high model requires two rounds of sorting and a cell sorter, so it is expensive and uh, more time consuming. It is more widely used in publications and it's more widely accepted as a, as a method to isolate naive T cells. And because you are using a cell sorter, it is possible to obtain a highly pure naive T cell population, obviously at the expense of yield. The CD62 ligand CD44 method, it uses a single sort, magnetic separation only, so it's, it's a lot faster and you get a higher yield. 
um, importantly, the cells are, that you get out of the sort are completely untouched by antibody. In this model, you do have to stain the cells that you will be injecting with CD45RB and CD4-specific antibodies. Uh, another important advantage of this model is that because you can do the whole process inside a cell culture hood using disposable reagents and equipment, you can guarantee uh, sterility of the final product, which is obviously important if you're working with immunocompromised animals. So here's the data. This graph is the percent weight change over the course of time. And I'll just go through these three key points about this graph as I go through the, the different groups. So the disease severity is dependent on the number of cells transferred. This is um, this dark gray line. These mice received 1 million NIE T cells. And this light gray line, these mice received half a million NIE T cells. So you can see there is a, a difference in the induction of weight loss. The memory cells do not induce weight loss. And that is this yellow line here. These are mice that were just injected with vehicle, no T cells. The red line are mice that were injected with half a million memory T cells. And you can see they track right along together, uh, no weight loss. And then the the antibody therapies have something of an effect, but it's not significant. So the green line is treatment with anti-TNF-alpha, and the blue line is treatment with anti-P40. This graph here on the side is just the area under the curve from day 28 onwards, just to, to give you a, a, another visual representation of the differences. So you can see there, with these two, my, the two groups of mice that got treated with the NIAC cells, they do experience significant weight loss. These mice do not, and these mice there's not really uh, much of a significant difference from the, from the unbeaten animal so with regards to weight loss alone. This is data from the CD62 ligand, CD44 sort. It's very comparable. Mice that didn't receive the transfer, obviously, just gain weight throughout the study. Mice that did receive the transfer either lose or, or do not gain weight, so they have active disease. And then mice that are treated with anti-TNF, there's uh, Looking at the line graph alone, it looks like there is some effect of the treatment, but it's, it's non-significant with regards to weight loss again. So here, and uh, another of the more traditional readouts of this disease is histology. So these are colon sections, h &E stained. The top row is the vehicle and the um, naive T-cell treated animals. And then the bottom row is the three uh, positive control groups. So looking at the vehicle, you can see that this looks very healthy. There's good um, tissue architecture, um, and everything everything looks normal. And this, everything does not look normal. There's obviously a lot of inflammation, a lot of uh, tissue damage. And then these three positive controls all look fairly similar. There's uh, distinct tissue architecture still visible. There is a bit of inflammation, but um, it's, it's much more similar to the, the vehicle than to the untreated animal. So there, there is a very big, um, obvious difference uh, with these positive control therapies when looking at the histology. And if you quantify that, looking at inflammation, edema, goblet cell depletion, epithelial cell damage, and then this is just the sum score of all four of those parameters, um, you can see that obviously there are significant differences uh, between the groups. So the memory T cell injection reduces disease severity, uh, and obviously the naive T cell injection induces severe disease. But what's important about this is that these two antibody therapies are having a significant effect on the histology. So particularly with anti p 40 but also um, anti-TNF with the edema and epithelial uh, cell damage has a significant effect. And if you compare that to this area under the curve graph from the weight loss that I showed earlier, remember that the antibody therapies didn't really have any effect if you just focus on weight loss. So like I said before, this model is very well defined. It's been it's been around for a long time, and uh, and a lot of people use it. This this one group published a very good review methods paper about this model, which we based our protocol on, and they talk about the different uh, outcomes that can happen in this model. Most of the mice will experience typical disease, which is uh, the onset of weight loss at around three to three to five weeks, and then continuing to lose more weight from then onwards. Some mice experience severe disease which is where they very early on suffer um, extreme weight loss and either die or, or euthanize due to extreme weight loss. Then there's a mice that have what I'm calling mild disease, which is where they don't experience weight loss, but then at the end of the study, you sacrifice the mice and run the histology and see that there is intestinal inflammation. Then there's what I'm calling no disease, uh, which is where there's no weight loss, no histological inflammation, um, and that's probably due to failure of engraftment. 
So if we compare this with the results that we get at biomodels, it's very similar, which is, which is nice because it means that we're running the model correctly, we're getting the expected results. So I'll come back to this pie chart, these pie charts in a little bit, but first of all, there is a lot of variability in this model, so I wanted to address why that's the case and if there's anything we can do about it. So I've got these three questions. First of all, why is weight loss used as the corollary of engraftment when it doesn't take into account around 30% of the animals? And the answer is that it's very easy to measure. You get a rapid, non-invasive, and relatively stress-free readout that does correlate um, fairly well with, with uh, disease induction and severity. Any animals that don't lose weight can be analyzed post-mortem, and you can verify the inflammation with histology, and you can verify engraftment by looking at the spinocyte CD4 count. So that's the, that's the current state of things. The next question is, what causes the variability? As I showed in those graphs earlier, we know that the disease severity is directly influenced by the number of transferred cells, so it's likely that the, some of the variability is due to the different rates of T cell engraftment due to uh, a number of different factors. And then lastly, can this model be enhanced? So what we do here at Biomodels is we do a in-life blood draw on day 14, take a very small amount of blood, and look for the presence or absence of T cells to confirm engraftment. And, uh, that has the advantage that you, you, that is before the onset of weight loss. So you, before you see disease by any sort of standard uh, readout, you can confirm or deny whether or not you're going to get disease in the first place. And then we also add in, as Greg talked about as well, uh, an in-life serial endoscopy. Um, it is clinically relevant. It adds an, a, an extra readout for, for disease, even in the absence of weight loss for those mice that are experiencing inflammation without weight loss. And it's also a direct measure of inflammation as opposed to weight loss, which is indirect. First of all, just talk about the blood draw very quickly. You take a very small amount of blood and look for CD45, which is present on all leukocytes, CD4, which is present only if the engraftment is successful. Uh, remember, the, the recipient mice are RAG2 knockouts, so they don't have T or B cells. And then CD8 is just a sort of control to make sure that your settings are right. It should be never present in any of these mice. So the top line is uh, a mouse that received a T cell transfer, and the bottom line is a mouse that did not receive the transfer. This is just a forward side scatter plot of the, of the blood. And then, uh, obviously, most of the uh, white blood cells are CD45 positive. Of those cells, you see here, there's a very distinct population of CD4 positive cells. And in the mouse that did not receive the transfer, there's essentially zero CD4 positive event. Getting back to this pie chart, we've got these four different disease outcomes. And then so uh, the question is, can the CD4 uh, count uh, tell you anything about these disease outcomes. So here is some data from Mars CD62 like and CD44 model. It's exactly the same as the weight loss data that I showed earlier, except rather than an average, it is every single animal graphed individually. The yellow lines are mice that did not receive any cell transfer, just for comparison, and the, the dark gray lines are mice that did receive the transfer. So first of all, you'll notice that there are two animals up here that seem to just be trucking right along with the, um, the mice that did not receive the transfer. And it turns out that on day 14, the CD4 T cell count was zero, which means that there was a failure in engraftment there, and, uh, and their endoscopy scores throughout the study were also zero. This one mouse here didn't really lose a lot of weight, but its day 14 CD4 count was 2.8%. Was and throughout the study, he had a um, uh, mild endoscopy score, so I would call this disease without weight loss or mild disease. Uh, the majority of the mice in this study had a, um, a good CD4 T cell count on day 14, and throughout the study, a mild to moderate endoscopy score, and we call this typical disease. And then these two mice here, they had a very high T cell count on day 14, uh, and uh, they uh, crashed out and had to be sacrificed due to uh, excessive weight loss early on in the study. Building on that, uh, there is a correlation between the day 14 CD4 count and the disease outcome. So if you try to correlate the day 14 CD4 count with um, the day 14 weight loss, there's really no correlation. It's, it's around about 0.5 or, or 0, essentially, depending on these two runs of these models that we, that we did. But as you go through the study, correlating the day 14 CD4 count with uh, the weight loss as the study progresses, you can see that the correlation increases dramatically. And at the end point, the day 14 CD4 count all the way back here correlates incredibly strongly with the final weight loss, which is very useful for predicting the disease outcome. And we see the same sort of pattern with endoscopy scores and correlating with the CD14 count. 
So just um, looking at the endoscopy scores now, this graph shows endoscopy score here on the left y-axis and the T-cell count on the right y-axis. The yellow line, again, is the mice that did not receive cells. The light gray line is the mice that did receive the naive T-cells. And then the dotted line is their T-cell count. You can see they track very well together. There's a good correlation there. And then the three positive controls, the, the red line is the memory T-cells. There is an initial endoscopy score, and I think that's just due to the fact that we did inject active T-cells into these mice. But that is brought down to just about zero by the end of the study. It's very, very low, and, and then zero at the end of the study. Um, importantly, these two antibody therapies do show significant reduction in the endoscopy score. And if you remember from the weight alone, there was no significant um, reduction. So looking at endoscopy as a throughout the study in life readout, you can see significant effects of, of the uh, antibody therapy, the positive control drugs. So in conclusion then, there's a correlation between the day 14 CD4 count and the disease outcome. So there's no need to retroactively remove animals from the final analysis because you know at day 14 whether or not you have any failed engraftment. Uh, you can remove them from the study early on. You can predict the disease outcome prior to the onset of weight loss. So if weight loss occurs between uh, weeks three and five and you're doing a T-cell count on day 14, you can randomize the animals into treatment groups based on what you're predicting the outcome is going to be, and that ensures that all groups are as equal as possible uh, at the end of the study. And then endoscopy allows for another in-life measurement of uh, inflammation, which is obviously very clinically relevant. Um, it supplements the histological data, but it also shows you um, inflammation throughout the study as opposed to right at the end, which the histological data does. So if there is a treatment effect, that is present early on but is lost towards the end of the study, you will pick that up with endoscopy, but you might not pick that up with histology. It, uh, endoscopy obviously agrees very well with histology and shows those significant effects of the positive control therapies. All of these points together, in my opinion, lead to more efficient study design and execution. So I have a couple of minutes left. I'm just going to very briefly talk about the uh, GVHD. Um, it is a uh, complication, a very important and uh, common complication of uh, stem cell transplant. It involves multiple organs, including the GI tract. Uh, it is dependent on the presence of T cells in the graft. And the host is immunocompromised, which is required for engraftment, but also potentiates the uh, activation of donor T cells. Um, the model I'll just go through very quickly. Here is our belt C um, recipient mouse receives a lethal dose of irradiation, total body irradiation. And then we harvest bone marrow and spinocytes from uh, black six mouse, so they're MH, MHC mismatched, deplete the CD3 cells from the bone marrow, and then mix them with the spinocytes to provide the uh, T cells uh, and inject those into the, into the mouse, um, and then we get GDHD. We measure this with a five-parameter uh, measuring scale that's based on weight loss, activity, posture, fertility, and skin integrity, uh, all of those on a scale of uh, zero for normal up to two for severe. We also measure daily weight change and, and survival. So again, this is, this is the weight loss. The take-home message from this graph is that um, there is uh, disease severity dependent on the number of cells injected. This is low dose and high dose. And um, the positive control FK506 or tachromus doesn't really have an effect on the weight loss. Looking at GVHD, Again, the same thing, increased cell injection leads to more severe disease. The positive control therapy, the clinically relevant tacrolimus therapy, doesn't really have an effect on the GVHD score. When you look at um, survival, this is, this is where you really see the effect. There is a lot of mortality in the groups that are untreated, but in the group that received the FK506, there's very, very low uh, mortality all the way up to the end of the study when uh, we have about 90 to 95% survival. So the, the uh, positive control therapy works as expected with regards to survival. We also add in endoscopy to this model uh, and, uh, and diarrhea, as, uh, assessing diarrhea incidence as a readout of um, the intestinal inflammation uh, caused by the GVHD. And at every single time point, there is a, a significant difference between mice that received the, um, the complete cell transfer and mice that received just the CD3 depleted bone marrow. And so we don't currently have data for uh, the endoscopy scores with FK506 treated animals, but uh, it's a drug that's currently uh, being looked at for the treatment of chronic IBD, uh, and it's shown some efficacy there. So 
we are reasonably confident that if, if this drug is used in this model, we'll see an effect on the endoscopy scores, even though um, we don't see the effect in, in weight loss of GVHD. We, we're confident that we'll see with endoscopy and uh, the incidence of diarrhea. Summarize the uh, GVHD portion. I'll actually just to sort of uh, mention here that we are expanding the GVHD uh, model to include chronic GVHD, Gropo's tumor effects, but also humanized GVHD. And the model for that is taking an NSG mouse, severely immunocompromised mouse, a sublethal dose of total body radiation, and inject human PBMCs from a single donor, and then you get the GVHD. The advantage of this is that you can um, selectively target human cytokines and cells, whereas in the mouse model, you're looking obviously purely at a murine model. So in summary, yes, the model is, it, it works very well in our hands. You can manipulate the disease severity by manipulating the number of cells that you inject. The clinical treatments have, do have the expected effects uh, on uh, survival, and uh, the addition of endoscopy um, could be useful uh, based on the fact that it's clinically relevant, direct measurement of tissue inflammation, and it has the potential to accurately reflect the GVHD progression across uh, different treatment groups. Uh, and with that, try to answer any questions if there's time, but thank you very much for listening. If you have any other questions that we don't get to answer, please feel free to email either Greg or myself. I think due to the time, we'll be answering all questions via email. As Dominic said, you can feel free to email them directly. Otherwise, we will contact you regarding the ones that were asked during the presentation today. Thank you very much, Greg, Dom, and Ashley. I'd like to thank Biomodels for sponsoring today's web symposium, for Greg and Dom, for their wonderful presentations. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of you who came and spent an hour with us. I hope you found solutions to your ongoing challenges. Thank you so much, and have a great day.